Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the community for being with us. We do have several of you in the room with us, and I know many more uh, virtually, and I can't say how, how nice it is to see folks um, with us tonight to participate in our public safety town hall. Um, I'm Eric Allegri, and we do have our mayor pro tem, Frank, Frank Zerunian, uh, with us as well from Rolling Hills Estates. And Mayor Derringer from Rolling Hills will be joining uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the hour as well. And then Captain Powers, in a moment, I'll, I'll hand it to him to uh, introduce his deputies who are with us. But uh, this is such an important forum for our city. Uh, we've been looking forward to having this opportunity, especially as the pandemic has been winding down, to get together and connect with our community uh, listen to your question. So we'll make some remarks. Um, Captain Powers will walk through some important information, but we do want to leave plenty of time for questions and answers to ensure we get to, uh, that we're responsive to your questions. For the, the, the city of RPV, I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of things. Um, over the last five years, since uh, 2015 and 16, uh, thanks to a lot of effort on part of the Sheriff's Department and city staff, the implementation of lots of new technologies and programs such as our automatic, uh, automatic license plate reader program, our flock security program, which is newer, our ring program, which many residents participated in, uh, and just a great partnership with the community. We've been able to realize a 35% reduction in crime since that time uh, for part, part one crimes, including burglaries, petty thefts, grand thefts. And so we're, we're proud of that as accomplishment that's led to um, our, our current ranking as a city as the, the fourth safest city in California. We're very proud of that. However, um, certainly any crime in our city is too much crime and therefore the, the work in front of us remains and we're taking uh, several steps to continue that work such as evaluating the opportunity for a sheriff's substation uh, at our civic center property uh, implementing new and special programs to, to, to deal with speed and, and to also uh, flex, uh, to flex our, our Sheriff's Department staff in areas where crime has, has peaked. Uh, we continue to invest in the flock program and are investing in new data systems that would allow us to track and trend crime on a more, more real-time basis. So, so lock, lots of work is occurring uh, that I wanted to acknowledge, but all this work is, is really for not without uh, the partnership of the community. And so it's uh, really in that spirit that uh, we're having tonight's forum. So with that, I wanna uh, welcome everyone and uh, allow Mayor Pro Tem Zerunian to make a few remarks as well. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate the invitation, first of all, and, and I value the collaboration of all the cities on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, which actually contribute to some of the data as well as the comments that you just made. We are partners in making sure that our community remains uh, safe. Uh, I view my personal responsibility to be one of the most important as an elected to provide for the quality of life and the safety of our residents. So this issue and this topic cannot be more important. And I really thank you for organizing this event. And I certainly appreciate our captain who happens to be our police chief uh, across the board in our cities here. And uh, we really appreciate him um, and, and, and his humble, humble service to our communities. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not remember the men and women in uniform um, overall that served the Lomita Station. They are wonderful people. We've always enjoyed a wonderful relationship with the, with the Lomita Station uh, in particular. And we've always had um, a safe environment because of them. So I want to thank them. I see Tammy there. Uh, I want to thank all of them uh, for uh, their service uh, to our communities. And I look forward to hearing from the captain. Thank, thank you so much, Mayor Pro Tem. And we uh, respect and appreciate your partnership as well. So with that, I will uh, hand it off to Captain Powers to introduce his team. Thank you very much, Mayor. And uh, Mayor Pro Tem Zerunian, it's a uh, pleasure to have you here as well. And uh, to all the members of the community, uh, I'd first like to uh, introduce my uh, part of my team here. I've, I've got some uh, core deputies here. I've got Sergeant Tina McCoy, uh, Deputy Tammy Bells, and Deputy Reese Sosa. And uh, they handle all of the uh, um, 
specific problems that relate to uh, the cities and they go out and uh, they're very, very proactive in what they do and in building and reinforcing the relationships within the community. And so with that being said, I'd, I'd just like to uh, just give a little brief introduction before we uh, hear from you and, and inquire about your concerns. Uh, but the whole point of this meeting is, is foundational upon the, the components of community policing and partnership building, which is a key component of that. The relationships between all of you that are either here in person or watching virtually um, and the members of the city government, it's the, uh, the involvement and the relationship and the participation. It's inc incumbent upon all of us to be part of that. Um, and communication is a key component of that, whether it's a meeting here like this or uh, just calling, uh, calling the station for a call for service. I can't emphasize the importance and value of that, and you'll hear me repeat that a little bit. Main concerns. Uh, main concerns are quality of life. That's my top priority. Your quality of life is my priority and my concern. And I've accepted that priority from day one, and I will continue to do that. That will always be my priority. Uh, in addition to the safety of my staff, and uh, it, there's a, a, fine, a fine balance between the two. Crime trends, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I know the mayor uh, acknowledged the, the uh, fourth safest city award, and, and that is an awesome, awesome accomplishment. And, you know, people thank me for that, and it's really not a thank you. It's a thank you to all of you. Because, like I said, that partnership, the, the totality of all of this is what allowed them to earn that achievement. Now, managing it is going to be the challenge. And, and that always has been. Um, and, and so with that being said, you know, the mayor talked about crime trends dropping over a five-year period. And unfortunately, uh, I, th those crime trends had not dropped. The last year has been very, very unique. And I've seen a slight uptick in certain crimes, and I've seen drops in others. Uh, as the mayor said, and I can't agree with more, one crime is one too many. You know, I would love to have goose eggs across the board and zeros to, to show across the, uh, as far as crime stats. Unfortunately, that's not a reality. And uh, if, if I can make that happen, well, then, um, yeah, we'll just wait and see. Uh, but I, I just, I want to be realistic about this. Traffic safety is always a concern as well. And it's, I can tell you with all of the cities on the peninsula, I communicate with the city managers, I communicate with city council, and I'm actively involved, and traffic safety is always a priority, not only of the cities, but of the, of the residents as well. And when we take some of the questions, I'm sure some of them will be traffic related, and I'll defer to either Sergeant McCoy or Tammy Bowser or, uh, or Deputy Sosa as far as providing some feedback on that. Um, crime trends, so what I've done, I just recently did a presentation to all the Peninsula City Government uh, about a week and a half ago, give or take, on uh, the first quarter of the year. And something that I did uh, in regards to that was something different. Instead of showing uh, um, pie charts and, and graphs, uh, we showed maps. We showed what we call a hot map. And uh, as you'll see on the PowerPoint presentation here that's, that's coming up, there's an example of a hot map. And so the, what I do on a regular basis, a daily basis, uh, I have a crime analyst that I work with very closely. And with that crime analyst, we, we, look at, we look for patterns, we look for any types of uh, behaviors that we may see. And what you're looking at on this first slide here is a combination of other thefts and robberies. The robberies are depicted in yellow. There's two of them. Now, when I say robbery, um, I, when I hear robbery, I hear, uh, I, I hear a sense of significant importance in, um, in the word robbery. But what I can tell you is these aren't stick em up robberies. These are what I refer to as an Estes robbery or a shoplift robbery, where somebody goes into a store and they shoplift and they steal alcohol or some other, some other product, and then the staff there tries to apprehend them and they resist in some sort of a way. That's classified as a robbery per the letter of the law. And so that's what those two are there. But those green dots, which are um, the number of 20, there's a, if you look at the little the legend up in the upper left corner of that, uh, it, it depicts that. And so there's 20 other thefts, and those other thefts could be a shoplift theft, a theft from a yard, uh, or some other type of a petty theft, or maybe even a grand theft, depending on the value of the merchandise. Can you go to the next slide, please? The next map depicts um, aggravated assaults and grand theft autos. And you see a lot less activity on that map. And this, these, uh, these maps are from April 1st of this year uh, to today. And so those numbers are low, and I'm, I mean, but there's three of them on there, so it's three too many. One thing I can say, 
Um, the mayor talked about some of the technology that the city's invested in as far as theft and, and theft prevention. I can tell you that um, year to date, we've had in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes 14 grand theft autos, but we have 30 arrests for grand theft auto throughout my station jurisdiction. I'm sorry, throughout Rancho Palos Verdes jurisdiction. That is through the use of the technology that's been invested by the cities on this peninsula. And it's just, that's, that's uh, worth its weight in gold. And I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail, I just wanted to share that as an example. Because I report to my executives on a monthly basis based on crime stats, and we review these very, very closely. Can you, next slide please. The next slide de uh, depicts burglaries. And so far, uh, all, all of these are in Rancho Palos Verdes uh, in the jurisdictional boundaries. And so you can see that uh, down below at the bottom of that, there's a little number two there. And typically that will in indicate two crimes in that same location, but in this situation it doesn't. It just re it depicts a follow-up uh, from that original crime of a, a theft or a burglary, and a supplemental report was documented. And unfortunately, this system's not perfect, so what it does is it, it uh, depicts another number there. Now, when I look at these maps in, in the live form in my office, I can click on that plus there, and it'll, it'll open up another window in there and it give me details that's entered by my crime analyst that gives me uh, specific information related to each and every incident. Can we go to the next slide, please? The next slide's a little bit busier. It includes shoplifts, thefts, petty thefts, and grand thefts. And I, I put these things together the way I did with, an, with, with it's purely intentional. And what I'm trying to, to reiterate to all of you that are watching is uh, if you look at thefts from motor vehicles, there's 28 of those at the bottom of that legend. And that's, that's what I call, uh, well, and, and most of those involve uh, smashing the windows of cars, cars being unlocked, left unlocked, windows down, and valuables in plain sight. And all of those things that I just identified are what I call uh, criminal opportunity. And it's something that we as residents and we as members of this community can prevent if we make a conscious effort to lock our vehicles, park them in the garage, and leave valuables, take the valuables out, out of plain sight, and uh, lock them up in the trunk, or take them into your home, or whatever it may be. Um, and and it, that's, that's something that's, uh, it, it, it really matters, it truly does. Can we go to the next slide? Um, the next slide, this, it's basically, uh, the other thefts again, and then um, they stuff that I've already discussed, and then the next one, if you would. The next one is Rolling Hills Estates and Rolling Hills. And so um, what I did is I included more of the different var varieties of the crimes in there because there's less than those cities. And if you look in the city of Rolling Hills and their jurisdictional boundaries, uh, they, they didn't have anything pop up, so they're actually at a zero. And uh, that's a good thing. but. Like I said, it, it seems a little busy in certain areas and you'll see over by Deep Valley and that you'll see a, a, a few bubbles there. And what those are, are shoplift, those are thefts. Uh, other thefts, there are shoplift thefts, there are petty thefts. Um, and there's one, uh, one residential burglary and one other burglary. And then off to the right, there's a couple grand theft autos. But with all of these slides that I've just gone to or gone through, um, there's no immediate pattern that I can identify that would prompt me to send some sort of a special problems team over there to you know, conduct some sort of a surveillance operation or whatnot. So that's just an overview of, of an example of what we go through at a crime management meeting uh, and, and also our regional law meetings. And um, just to conclude with, with why, uh, what my vision is and what I've implemented since my arrival, is it's their community policing concepts. And there's an acronym called PAVE, and it stands for Partnership, Accountability, Visibility, and Enforcement. And it speaks for itself, but the, uh, the partnership is between law enforcement and the community. And that's foundational upon community policing, and it has been for quite some time. And it's something I teach at our academy, and I've taught throughout the, throughout, throughout the country as well. Uh, the accountability, uh, well, I, I just explained a few accountability examples as far as us uh, reducing that criminal opportunity, and for us to be invisible, which is the, the next acronym in, that, in that, uh, that statement, is visibility. I have encouraged my staff to be more visible. Um, 
on the weekends, I want them driving down residential streets that they'd never driven down before, just to be visible and to let you see us out there and to make you aware of the fact that we are out there and we care about your quality of life. And so with that, I'll uh, conclude and um, open it up to any questions. Thank you so much, Captain Powers. And, and I know that, um, I believe McKenzie, I don't know if you could provide the details on folks that are interested in submitting questions that are virtual. Yes, um, First Mayor Derringer has joined if, if she would like to make any comments. Sure, yeah, now let me introduce uh, Mayor Derringer. I know she's got a busy night with two adjacent uh, meetings. So uh, Mayor, would you like to make a few remarks? Um, yes, thank you so much for all of you who are interested in taking part of this town hall. It, it's been something that's been um, uh, something I've been wanting to do for a long time because I do see a lot of repeated crimes where people are uh, unfortunately not locking their doors, not locking their cars, and we end up getting crimes of opportunity. So it's really important to be vigilant. Uh, and as a full-time deputy district attorney, in addition to being the mayor of my city and the chair of the regional law enforcement program for the peninsula, uh, it's it's something that I want to keep underscoring for residents uh, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to be vigilant because uh, there are a lot of criminals who would like to, to venture into the peninsula and are venturing on the peninsula and committing uh, crime. So we want to make sure that we do things and, and act in a way that will inhibit that and best enable our sheriffs to find the crime and and uh, investigate it and so it can be prosecuted. Uh, but thank you. I, I don't want to take up too much time. Unfortunately, I had some problem getting the, the Zoom link and, and getting on board. So I apologize for my delay in getting in on this meeting. Thank you. That's okay, Mayor. You're right on time. It sounds like we're going to pivot to community questions. Mackenzie, if you could provide the, the details and logistics for folks interested in submitting questions, that would help. Yes. For those of you who are here in person, if you'd like to ask a question, you're welcome to come up to this chair here in the front, and then we'll call on you to ask your question. For those of you joining online, you can enter your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom, or you can use the raise hand feature. And we'll begin with one of the questions that was submitted uh, before this meeting. This question was from Joseph Trau. And he says, I live at PVBC, which is a very unsecured complex of 10 residential buildings. Security cameras catch thieves after the fact. I find them a waste of our HOA funds. Our cars and garages are being broken into and packages and lobbies are being stolen. We have told residents to lock cars, no valuables in cars, take packages to neighbors if left in our mailroom lobbies. It is now happening nightly. Aside from major costly security, what more can be done until we can secure all buildings? I'll go ahead and take this one as I, as I look at this stuff. It sounds like you're taking proactive efforts already. Um, I would recommend uh, maybe, I don't know if you have some sort of a neighborhood watch program in your complex, but I would, I would make that as a suggestion. As far as the cameras uh, catching thieves after the fact, believe it or not, that can be very useful for our investigators when they uh, conduct their follow-up investigations regarding the crimes. And we have, in fact, solved crimes based on that uh, type of identification where somebody recognizes the person. Uh, communication, I mean, the, uh, it sounds like the, uh, the, the crime opportunity, uh, cr you know, steps that you're taking, uh, it, it may or I'd have to look at that more specifically and more closely, but the, uh, the communication of your neighbors looking out for one another, uh, see something, say something, any type of suspicious activity. Uh, our policy at our station is we will take every call for service. I don't want anything handled over the phone. And so if you call into the station reporting some sort of suspicious activity, we will send a deputy sheriff out there to investigate. And, uh, you know, be as proactive and as vigilant as you can, like Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Derringer had said. Um, your involvement is a key component of this. And I know a lot of people don't want to get involved sometimes. Uh, you can call us and we will we can remain, uh, keep it anonymous where we uh, just use you over the phone or whatnot. Um, and we won't involve you unless we absolutely have to. And we're only going to do that with your approval and your permission. And so uh, with that, I would, you know, if there's, if there's more specifics uh, besides what's in this question, um, you, you know, we, we can discuss that. I can put you in contact with one of my core deputies here to discuss further. 
uh, any further options and, uh, and strategies. Is there anyone here in person who would like to ask their question? Go ahead. Hi, good evening. If you push, I'm not sure if it's, there we go. Can you hear me? Should be live now. Thank you. Thank you all for what you do and thank you for allowing us to speak as well and listening. So my question is regarding public safety. Um, I've lived in Rancho Palos Verdes for eight years. There have never before been so many coyotes in my neighborhood as during this year. Even out of season, coyotes are present on a weekly basis on our streets and gardens at all hours during the day. They are no longer afraid of people, boldly approach and stand their ground when hazed. Dogs and cats are taken and killed in their own backyards. It has reached the point that I am gravely concerned that a small child or infant will be harmed or killed as more coyotes return to our gardens, viewing them as a food source. When we moved here eight years ago, we had a baby and a toddler. We knew nothing about coyotes. I would leave my small children out in the grass and myself coming in and out of the house. This scenario eight years on fills me with absolute dread. I strongly believe that there should be signs posted all around the peninsula warning of the dangers of coyotes. And I believe this staggering development in the habits and behaviors of our coyote population that I and my neighbors are witnessing must be addressed. Um, I'm block captain on my street, so I have a pretty accurate picture of the coyote activity in my area. My, fa my family's quality of life at home has been unquestionably impacted by this situation. We can no longer enjoy, enjoy the indoor-outdoor lifestyle that drew us to become residents here. Our doors remain constantly closed, and any time we enter the garden, we are fraught with anxiety hovering over our dog. Our neighbor's dog was snatched and killed just a couple of weeks ago and another dog attacked in front of them. Please hear me when I say the situation has escalated out of control, it's despite the current coyote management policies in place. I'm aware that coyote control is a controversial topic, but the safety of our community must come first. I ask what can be done now before we're forced to address the situation following a tragic event. Thank you for your Thank question. You. Thank you so much for your question. I'll, I'll let our uh, city manager yes. uh, respond. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and for the public's benefit, um, you may be aware that we do have a coyote management plan in the city. It's on the website, and I've got the website open. One of the things that um, we, we try to emphasize with the coyote management plan is how to coexist with coyotes. And so what we do is if you get in touch with the city's code enforcement officer, Rudy Monroe, he'll come out to your property and conduct a, a yard audit to see what measures could be implemented to help deter coyotes. So, so I, I encourage you to continue to reach out to the city and, and we can come out and do that yard audit. If you, if you could, ma'am, put your um, mic on just for the Sorry. the audience. I apologize. That's okay. Sorry, I've um, I've I have done this and I've spoken with Rudy and I've met with Rudy. Okay. Um, it just seems very clear to me um, that the coyote, the, the the behaviors and the numbers are just have increased so much in the last year that it no longer seems like a appropriate thing to be trying to coexist with them when they're coming out in the middle of the day. Um, you know, it's not like it's just in the, ev in the evening and uh, yes. dawn anymore. It's during the daytime hours. It's, you know, midday. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and I'm honestly fearful that um, as they come into our yards and they are seeing our pets as a food source, it's an easy food source for them, that a child or infant may be killed. That is my concern. Yeah, and it is a, it's a legitimate concern that the city takes very seriously. And and one of the things that um, I think we're observing with with coyotes' behaviors is that they've they've existed in, on in the peninsula and, and throughout uh, the Los Angeles area. We're seeing more and more of them because they're looking for food sources. And and of course, when you look at what those food sources are, it's not only what you have in your yard. Um, simple things that you don't really think about, such as as um, your bird feeder, 
I mean, that, that, that is something that coyotes are looking for, fruit on your trees. And especially when fruit falls on the ground of your yard, if you don't pick it up, the coyotes are looking for that. And, and of course, I, I, I hate to say this, but small pets, I mean, they, they are watching. And coyotes are very smart animals. They are watching, they're studying behaviors, and they're, they learn and, and they've adapted. Um, and so what we have to do as, as, um, as residents of the community is 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 understand how they're behaving and and be very uh, vigilant of what we're doing out there, um, but but that that said, I mean these yard audits and it sounds like um, Rudy has been out to your property to conduct a yard audit. We try to work with the neighborhood um, and, and work collectively because one pr it, it can't just be one household. It's got to be the whole can neighborhood I, that works together to, to try to uh, address those and, and implement those deterrents. Is there anything in place that warns new residents of the dangers of coyotes? Because when I came here again, I knew nothing about yeah. coyotes and it, it terrifies me, the idea of a new family coming into our community and not knowing that there is this risk with small children. What we try to do, and the outreach is really important because it is, um, many people are not aware of it. New residents come in and they don't realize a lot of things that, that um, they should be paying attention to. And and we 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 periodically publish um, the, the quarterly newsletter and we put articles in there. And every household in Rancho Palos Verdes gets a copy of that, that, um, that newsletter. And we'll put information on coyotes, um, things that, that the residents should be aware of. We turn to um, those of you who've lived in the community, when you go welcome your new neighbor, um, to approach him and say, hey, by the way, this is something that we're paying attention to. You can contact the city. They'll come out and do a yard audit. Um, we, we monitor. We've On our website, we've got a tracking system for the entire peninsula. All four cities on the Palos Verdes Peninsula participates on this tracking um, dashboard where if you see activity log it in, you can do it on your mobile app or on, on your desktop, log it, we track that, we print quarterly reports of that, and we monitor what the activity is based on what you input. And, and that helps us keep track of what's going on, and we work closely with the county to determine what type of measures need to be implemented to address um, the coyote behaviors. So it's really, we rely on you to also pass, uh, to, to communicate to new neighbors and to your neighbors who've been there a while who may not be paying attention or just got relaxed on some of the um, deterrent measures. Thank, thank you so much for the question. I, it's a great one, and I think you're not alone. I believe several folks submitted related questions, and I think your point about education is an important one, so we'll absolutely continue to educate. And then I, I wonder if there's an opportunity through the Council of Homeowners Associations to kind of disperse information through the HOA boards as well. So I think that's something we can we can look at doing again. And then I do want to give uh, Mayor Pro Tem and um, Mayor Derringer, of course, Ara's comments are, are true for the whole peninsula, but uh, I want to give you an opportunity to add anything if you'd like. Um, yeah, we have a problem with coyotes in rolling hills as well and um, we do have the services from LA County uh, a guy named Fernando who's been doing this for years who does uh, trap the coyotes and but it's not all of them and it and it's not going to ever be all of them it's mostly the ones that have been coming out during the day when we have coyote sightings but they do need have permission from homeowners to trap them on their property. And so um, I, I, I too am very concerned about the fact that not only have pets, many pets been taken away and killed, um, but also there could be attacks on humans if they get more brazen. They have been having more sightings during the day. So it, it I have two small dogs and I just am vigilant. I don't I don't walk them when it's uh, getting dark. Uh, and um, so there's definitely you need to be more careful with your pets because they will do them. And if you're walking the dog, you need to grab and a coyote comes, you need to grab your dog immediately and just run after the coyote. Just like not meaning run after, but just be, you know, yell, scream, make a lot of noise um, because uh, you don't want them attacking you just to get to your dog. Um, and so that's kind of the things we've learned from our animal 
control person that is helping us to make sure that they're not doing more harm to people's pets or attacking humans. Thank you, Mayor Derringer. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tim, did you want to add some comments on this topic as well? The only thing I want to say, because I don't want to belabor the point, I think Ira said it well, we also have major uh, resources on our website. Um, I recall seeing coyotes 40 years ago when I was walking with my uh, uh, on the Palsbury's Peninsula, but then they were extremely skittish and all day, the minute they saw you, they went away. I sympathize with the speaker. Unfortunately, they've gotten more and more uh, ab abrasive and, and, and more uh, aggressive, but I still have not found them to be extremely aggressive against humans. Um, uh, but that could happen. But I want everyone to know that our animal control, you are in control of your private property. If there is a particular coyote that becomes extremely aggressive on your private property, please do call animal control or call your city. Um, and we will help you get animal control to trap that very aggressive animal. There are criterion on uh, trapping a very aggressive coyote. Um, so uh, our eyes right, we have to learn to coexist and live with them, but at the same time, we cannot permit a very, very aggressive coyote uh, to actually run amok. So um, I sympathize with the uh, person who spoke, um, and we have very similar problems in our city, and uh, let's use all of our resources and help each other to make sure that they get scared of us again. Please scare them. Do everything you can to scare them. That's part of the process. Uh, I've thrown things at them before and uh, screamed, yelled, run towards them. I mean, I've done all sorts of things, but that's combined. They need to be scared of us. We all need to do all this together. Thank you, well, well said. And I, the only final remark I'll make also is every year, at least for the city of RPV, we reassess our coyote management plan. We look at the census and reassess. So that will be another opportunity to provide additional feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think education is very important. Agree. The, the residents. Thank you. Thank you. Just a note that one comment came in from Sharon Yarber saying we need to cite people who feed coyotes and raccoons and other wildlife too. Okay. Thank, thank you. And thanks for that comment, Sharon. And uh, Gwen Butterfield shared that coyotes are a true concern but not a sheriff issue. And... Mary Ross has a question. Were mask mandates enforced, especially in large gatherings, Cavalry Church area and High Ridge Park? There were signs to call the sheriff, but when this was done, no action was noted. I'll go ahead and take that one. I can tell you that when the mask uh, mandates were, were implemented um, a while back, uh, the sheriff came out with a, uh, uh, basically instructions not, not to cite. So what we did, during the mask mandate is we tried to educate folks and I supplied masks to all of our deputies at the station. And so if we found people that were not in compliance with the mask, instead of citing them for a mask, we issued them a mask to try and gain their compliance. And um, that seemed to have worked for us. So that's that's the, the best I can do as far as answering that. Regarding any calls for service at the church, um, like I said, those are the instructions and the marching orders that uh, all of my deputies were instructed with. Thank you, Captain. And the next is Sandra Behrens has your hand up. You can now speak if you would like to unmute yourself. I didn't have my hand up. I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> Thank no. you. No, no problem. Mackenzie, I didn't know if there were other questions in the room also before. If, if someone in the room would like. Captain Powers, thank you for saying that um, safety is a priority. And I think safety in our own yards is a priority as well. And what I'm hearing is a lot of rhetoric. And I challenge you all. Because these coyotes are jumping into our yards. I have a coyote that's jumped in my yard now three times. Killed my dog. While we were standing there, my husband came out. A pack of coyotes jumped in my yard that morning. Killed my dog, took my dog. My husband comes out. It injured and made my, my other dog bleed. And my husband couldn't scare the coyote away. It stood there. 
It did not leap. I am now daily living my life waiting for that coyote to jump in my yard. I have an aggressive coyote. So guess what? I did everything you said. I called Rudy. I called Fernando. Fernando came. He set a loop trap. Something ate the bait over and over again. The coyotes are too smart. Loop traps aren't effective, and we all know it. So I asked Fernando, why are you setting the trap? Are you setting the trap to appease me, to make me feel better? And he said, yes. And that's what's happening. We have no plan. We have no coyote management plan. We just have a pretty little website that tells us to report to Rudy, to report to the city, to put your sightings on there, and people are mad. They're on next door, and they're mad. We had a poodle taken right in front of the family two weeks ago. We had a black lab being walked down the street, and a coyote attacked it in the daylight while it was on a leash. We had a party over at Sandbrook with people, children, music, and the coyote jumped in the yard while this was all going on to attack a dog. We have a problem, people. And no one's saying anything that makes any sense to me right now. And I really do not want to live in fear in my neighborhood. I've lived here 24 years. I have seen coyotes rarely. And when I did, it was dusk or dawn. And I could easily chase them off. Not anymore. They're not afraid. They're not afraid of us. They're overpopulated and they're aggressive. And I don't have any safety in my yard. I didn't have a bird feeder in my yard when my dog was attacked. I didn't have fruit on my trees when my dog was attacked. So I think we need to be thinking a little differently and doing something else. I hear other cities are taking action. I know other states take action. Why aren't we? Why are we not taking action? What are we gonna do? Are we gonna wait until another little girl is killed, another little three-year-old in her front yard is killed by a coyote? Are you guys willing to, to take that responsibility? I wouldn't want to if I were in your shoes, none of you. What are we gonna do and how can we help you to do your job to help us stay safe? Thank you, and thank you for the courage to share that feedback. Uh, I don't know, Ar, if you wanna add anything to the traps because what I will say is the coyote management plan has an escalation process embedded within it for aggressive coyotes, and trapping is a, a part of that. I hadn't heard feedback that the traps were ineffective as you're, as you're sharing with your experience, so I don't know, or if you wanna add anything to No, your, and, uh, and, and I first wanna apologize, because I, I know how traumatic that could be. I've, I've heard from many residents about the, those types of killings where they've witnessed their pet, um, and I know that that's, that's, that's scarring, and, and I understand that. I, I, I do want to say our plan and what we implement isn't rhetoric. I mean, we take it very seriously. Um, the traps, we do set up the traps. We have trapped coyotes before. Um, they, the animal is a very smart animal, and they can, they can sense, uh, they, they, they smell the trap, and that's different to them. The minute they, scent, they take that scent, they go away. And what we've found is when we've set up traps in certain areas, um, because it's warranted, the coyotes will pick up on that sense and they will leave. So sometimes it may not capture and, and catch a coyote, but it deters them, it sends them away. And so what we're trying to do, and, and you may not and I understand it's hard to process, but that's what we're, from science that we, we look at the data and we do the tracking, we see when they leave a neighborhood and we work with neighborhoods uh, collectively to, to address the situation. So, um, and it sounds like you've, a few of your neighbors are here. Um, we, we will work with you and, and see what we could do in terms of trapping, if there needs to be a different type of trap that we can use, um, but we do take it seriously. I appreciate that. The traps were set. The coyotes keep jumping over my fence, my six foot fence. Yeah. Yeah, they, they... And a pack jumped my fence when they came for my dogs, a pack. So yeah, a different kind of trap. I was told you couldn't use a different kind of trap. 
I'd have to, we'd have to look into it and talk to the county about what they use, because the county does the trapping for us. And, and one of the things I, I, I want to um, clarify, it, it, depending on the type of coyote, if you're looking at a coyote that um, is, is, looks ill or injured or has died, you need to call the, um, the county animal control. If it's an aggressive coyote, we suggest you call the city code enforcement or you call LA County uh, Weights and Measures because they're the ones who do the, the trapping. So two different agencies within the county uh, depending on the, the condition of the coyote. I think all of this needs to be clarified on the city newsletter because it is very confusing. I called animal control. They didn't want to help me. They didn't know what to do. Um, they didn't know where to send me. I, I ended up calling the Department of Agriculture. Who would think to call the Department of Agriculture to catch a coyote? Any of you? Probably not. No, and that, that is why. And that is the right place yeah. to call. Yeah, and, and I, I've got the information here on the web. It's one of the first paragraphs in, in the uh, on the city's website regarding coyotes to make that distinction on which agency to call. Right. So maybe we need a little bit more um, clarification, communication in the newsletters, but we also need to handle this problem because, as I'm as I'm aware, there are no other traps to set but these loop traps. From especially being in what you know we call the city, right? We're not in Rolling Hills Estates where they can get in the car and take a rifle and shoot these animals. We're in a neighborhood. But I do have an 80 plus acre field behind my house and you're all welcome to come and shoot coyotes anytime you want because that's where they're at and they're just coming right into our yards. And ma'am, I'm just curious. It sounds like a few of your neighbors are here tonight as well. So as a follow up, I'm seeing a few nodding heads. Um, as a follow-up, I think maybe we should just have our own individual meeting with the neighborhood that's been so dramatically affected by this uh, as a follow-up to, to tonight. I so. think that would be a good idea, but you also have a lot of people on next door, and if you're not monitoring that app, that's probably only half the people that are dealing with this because I'm sure many people are not actually posting what's happened to them and their animals and their yards being invaded by coyotes. So I think you have a much bigger problem than just my neighborhood. Yeah, I agree. I think there's an opportunity to, to re-educate. I think I, I know Mayor Derringer, you have your hand up. Did you want to add something? Um, yes, I just wanted to say, because you, the resident has been talking about incidents that happen inside a fence, fenced yard. Um, so if you have a six foot fence, Coyotes can they jump, they don't just spring over the fence. They have to touch their front two paws to the top of the fence and they cut the rest of their body over. If you get a coyote roll, which is something that goes on top of the fence, they're not able to do that. When they try to get some traction with their front paws, it just keep it just rolls and slips. So they, they can't get footing get over the fence. It has to be still a high fence, but they don't just springboard over the fence. Uh, and I know that that's not a total, you know, control, but at least it would help for the situation when you're inside your yard, especially with, with your dog and everything and having them jump over. I appreciate that. However, I have a camera and the coyote flew over my fence. It did not need to put its paws on top of my fence. Okay. And I think um, they can jump higher than six feet. If you look at the coyote, I think it even says on your website that they can jump higher than six feet. And we in the city are not allowed to put up barbed wire or anything like that, are we? In, in Rancho Palos Verdes, no, you cannot put barbed wire on a fence. Right. But you, you're, yeah. Um, and you are correct. I mean, they could leap over a six-foot fence. And in our city, we do allow um, fences up to seven feet in height. I think that, that foot may make a difference. Um, and then there's a process where you could apply for a, a permit to have a taller fence as well. Okay, so you do have to apply for a permit. Thank you. Um, I do want to comment. I, I have four young kids of my own who are outside often, so I completely sympathize with the fear and the and I heard from the earlier speaker as well that concern that when you walk away that something could happen so I can relate thank you okay the next question there's a series of uh, this first one is from Sharon Yarber really are you seeing any increase in crime with Gascon as DA 
And as a follow-up question, there are a series of um, generally, what are the cities taking? Are the cities taking any action uh, in regards to DA Gascon? Um, Want to partner with it? Yeah, go ahead and take the first piece. I'll take the second. As far as any increase in crime, um, I, I, I don't have any evidence to show or indicate that it uh, has any relationship with the, with the DA involved in it, with any of his efforts. Um, I'm just monitoring the crime, and like I said, it's I'm not seeing any spikes there. In, a, in terms of the, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes response, I will acknowledge that on our agenda for next Tuesday, there's a topic of discussion on this, this very issue. So that's coming up just next week. And then I'll let uh, my colleagues uh, comment for their, for their cities. Uh, Mayor Pro Tim. Uh, nothing to comment on. Uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, it may come to us as well. Um, but um, um, uh, it's an issue that uh, from a legal standpoint, it's the citizens of LA County that can recall an elected official. I'm not sure that the city taking a position is not gonna make that much of a difference. Um, I think that if there is any change that is desired, uh, there needs to be a recall petition circulated and that recall petition uh, would ultimately would be dealt with under the Constitution of California. So uh, I don't know that that kind of a thing, it, to me, is sounds more political than, than, uh, than administrative or legal in, in perspective. But um, I don't know him. I don't have any views one way or the other, frankly. But um, that's if the citizens of this county, including the people who are asking the question, wish to see change, then uh, they should p circulate a petition. And, and, and Mayor Derringer, I want to acknowledge, as she mentioned earlier, um, is, a, is a deputy prosecutor in, in the department, and therefore I, I think it's probably uh, best for us not to, to require or ask for her response to the discussion topic. Next question. And, and I am here as, as a mayor in my capacity as mayor, um, not as a uh, deputy district attorney. And, and it's true, it, 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 you are talking about you know, my current boss and, and there have been changes that are different. So that is true. So our city is looking at a letter as well. Um, I didn't take part in and I have to, it's a conflict of interest for me to have discussed it and or to vote on it, so I did not. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, can a citizen volunteer in policing like PVE does? I saw a couple of times cars marked as police volunteers driving around in PVE. And this is from Wayne Lee. Uh, we do offer a volunteer program at Lomita Sheriff Station. Um, it's called Volunteers on Patrol. So if you are interested in participating in um, volunteering, you can uh, go to the station and pick up an application and submit it, and then um, it will be processed. Does anyone here in the room like, would anyone like to make a comment? Ad a question? Additional questions in the room? OK. okay. Um, Jacob Conkey. Oh, oh. I, I think, ma'am, ma do you have a question? Uh, please. Sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure if the green light's lit, but you can just touch it and that'll be live. Oh, there I go. Um, my, just like my grandma said, a coyote did jump over her fence and killed her dog. And it's hard as a 10 year old having a dog loved very much die. And like any other kid, um, having a pet die because of a coyote or any other type of animal is very hard. And a coyote has jumped over our fence too while talking and it was like nine o'clock at night. And there's been a video or two that I've watched of a coyote jumping my grandma's fence again at seven o'clock in the morning. And they're coming back in the day and it's, it's hard to watch an animal die that you have loved because they're like your best friend. Sometimes you feel lonely, but you have an animal there with you 
and that animal will make you feel happy. And when you see that animal die because of another animal, it's hard because they were like your best friend and now they're gone. Like my grandma's dog, my grandpa hit was like that dog's best friend and now he's gone. And it's very hard as any age watching a pet or animal die. Thank, thank you for sharing that with us. And we're so sorry for your loss. Hi, good evening. Green light is on. Yes, I go ahead and speak into the mic. Hi, my name is uh, Bob Cash. I've been a resident of the peninsula, uh, now called RPV, for 54 years. And uh, when I bought in 1967, it was for the community environment that was provided here. I thought the law enforcement then, which was the sheriff's department, we were county property at the time was outstanding and the crime rates were low. And in spite of the crime statistics increasing in the city, in the county, and around the country, RPV is still a great safe place. So I just want to congratulate the sheriff's department for the fine work that you do I have one complaint. I had an encounter with a sheriff 20, 25 years ago who knocked on my door at 1.30 in the morning, which gave me quite a start to let me know that I had forgotten to close my garage door that evening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, officer. That is above and beyond the call of duty, but that's the kind of community interaction between the sheriff and a citizenry that I think makes us very successful. Changing the subject, uh, I live in the neighborhood that these people have been talking about. Uh, I'm a bit of a naturalist and uh, admire uh, the wildlife uh, for what it means to us in some respects. I have a small 20 pound uh, pet dog who is half Jack Russell and she hasn't met a big dog she likes. So when the coyotes come to our backyard, which they do a couple of times a week, she's ready to take them on. I kid you not, she is ready to go after the coyotes and the coyotes are just trying to bait her out of my reach, my surveillance, to do their business and no doubt she'd be a loser. So yeah, it is, it is a problem. Uh, I'm not sure what the solution is. I don't think it's education. I think people are by and large pretty tuned in to the issue. They have to be. And the communication in, in our neighborhood and around the peninsula I think is outstanding. Thanks in part by the work of the city. But um, so far it, it seems to be modest or insufficient to the dilemma. I don't know the answer. I understand coyotes and their breeding habits and what would happen if you tried to eradicate them. But uh, gosh, we need to uh, take more specific, tangible action beyond just popularizing the issue. Thank you for your- Thank you for your- For your effort in having this meeting and entertaining our comments. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure Captain Powers and the deputies here appreciate your, your comments about their hard work. Keep it up. This next question is from Kathy Tyndall. Almost all of PV is designated a high fire danger zone. How do the cities monitor homeless encampment, encampments in light of the recent fire that occurred in Pacific Palisades last week? Related to this, uh, questions were submitted from June Wagner, who says, I'm worried about safety at a home very near Friendship Park. 
One day there was a man either sleeping at our front door as a homeless person or someone who was pretending to be sleeping for, for, uh, for other no good. We did not report this incident and Bob Smith submitted increasing vagrancy, what's going to be done? So relating to homelessness. Uh, typically, we, we work uh, with the residents. That's uh, when they call us and they let us know there's an issue. Um, we go out and address it and see, see what's, uh, what's going on, check out the area. Um, and when it comes to the parks, usually the people that work at the parks, the department will let us know right away. And um, we get out there and, and uh, if it's illegal for them to be there, we get them out. Some places, you know, it's, it's not illegal just being homeless in and of itself, but uh, sleeping on somebody's front door, that would be something we could address versus somebody just walking down PCH. Um, but yeah, we rely heavily on, on residents calling us for, for everything from, from solving crimes, uh, making arrests uh, and handling uh, problems like this. And, and I can add to that, um, in regards to our open space, I mean, the city does have 1,400 acres of open space areas, part of the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. We, um, we monitor all the trails in the open space area, but it's a, lot of, it's a lot of acreage to cover by just a few individuals, so we rely heavily on, on public um, communication with us whenever they see something. We have had encampments. We're, we're usually notified immediately by a neighbor or one of the rangers, and, and we'll go out there and address the situation immediately. Um, the, the other thing is if you see something in the preserve or even in any of our park areas, we, we strongly encourage residents to call the city's hotline. We have a ranger hotline number, and I'll get that number before the end of uh, the town hall provided to you. And uh, additionally, the, uh, if we do run into something where it's an encampment, more than just one person, it, it's pretty rare. We don't, we don't uh, see that. Um, but we have resources. We have a, a, a part of our department that they go countywide, and we can contact them. They bring out all kinds of resources from mental health evaluators and people to try to get them on track. Um, and residents that know of a, a regular problem, if you go on the, it's a county website and you can contact me at the sheriff's station if, uh, if you want the name of it because I don't remember it offhand. But you can anonymously um, enter somebody's information and where you typically see them. And I know it works because I, I've used it. Um, and they will go out, they will send out people. They, the, a lot of times the people that are out there, they respond differently to somebody in regular clothes versus somebody in uniform. And they don't wanna talk to us for the most part. Uh, so they'll go out there and try to get them help, find a shelter for them. And some of them, they don't want help, and some do. So it, it, uh, we have a couple different ways we can, we can address those issues. And as far as uh, there was a question about the, the fire hazard, we definitely would, if, if you see anybody having a fire in an encampment, call us right away so we can send somebody out there before it, it becomes a bigger problem. And a lot of the potential fire areas, uh, all the cities have, have fire prevention. It's been kind of a hot topic lately for uh, proper trimming and getting brush cut back and things of that nature. But yeah, if anybody sees uh, uh, a homeless encampment or even if it's just one or two people and they're having a fire where they shouldn't, call, call us right away and we will respond out there along with the fire department and take care of it. Thank you. And I was able to locate the, the Ranger hotline number. For those of you who want to jot that down, it is 310-491-5775. That's 310-491-5775. And that's for Rancho Palos Verdes. If you see something unusual, please report it to the hotline. Does anyone here? Have any questions? Hey, good evening. How are you? Your, your, your daughter is very brave. Yes, she is. She's yeah. awesome. So is my wife. She practically fought off a coyote in our backyard the other night with people that gathered around and two dogs. A coyote jumped our fence and she had to run at it screaming to chase it out before it took our dog. If she wasn't paying live, attention. We don't live in this. These are multiple neighborhoods. 
right? So there's multiple okay. communities asking you guys for help tonight. And um, it's, it's really not clear how the RPV Coyote plan is having any effect. We can't see any benefit from that. I don't know if you have a metric that demonstrates any kind of efficiency to that plan. We'd love to see it. What can we do to help you guys be more effective? Because hazing them and keeping food indoors is not the right step. It's too passive. We need an active plan. And I would say continue to reach out to us and, and communicate that information because what we're doing is through the, the tracking, we can see um, it, it's, sort of, it's a heat map, so it shows us where the activity is and we can monitor. That's sort of the metric that we have is, and this is peninsula wide, we can see based on the reporting activity, if we take certain measures in a certain neighborhood and we see a drop in those reporting activities, it tells us that the, the coyotes have moved on to another area. And what the whole- like Collecting what we're, data is useful, but taking action on it is another thing. And that's, look, we, I know, because um, we've gone out there and we've had these yard audits and we work very collect, uh, collaboratively with the, with the residents to implement these measures. The, what we're trying to do here is keep the coyotes in the canyons and not up in the residential neighborhoods. And that's what, and these deterrent measures um, are, are supposed to be effective. But yes, I mean, so, um, the coyotes learn and, and they, they adapt to some of these I, things. Sorry that we, to interrupt. I feel like we're kicking the can down the road. Maybe we're at the wrong meeting for this, but we need to have a more focused effort. I, the sheriffs do awesome, right? Like fourth safest city in the California, fantastic but the coyote problem is real, and you're kicking the can down the road. When, when is our, I'm thinking it's, is it July that our coyote management plan annual review is coming up? So we do, we, we do the annual review for um, the peafowl right. population, but we don't do that for the, the coyote management plan. That's, a, that's an ongoing, it was updated a few years ago. Um, we worked together with the other cities on the peninsula and with, with some scientists on updating the plan. And, and so that's what we've got in effect now. And we, we do go out with the county and we can trap and we will trap. Um, but but we've got to work with the residents on, on setting up those traps, and we and we've been Are successful. Threatening? So so sir, I think I think what I'll do is uh, I don't have the council with me here, of course, and the coyote management plan is a reflection of council policy. So what I'm willing to do is at least request that our um, we agendize it uh, and see if my council colleagues agree. If they agree, it'll be agendized. And we can and have a more thorough discussion on it. I think that's what you're requesting is Absolutely. what's next. Yeah, I don't want to waste everybody's time sure. or, you know, continually talking about something that might not be as significant. Right. But the sheriffs have everything under control. We've got a safe city. It's amazing, right? But our dogs aren't. I, pre I appreciate that. And I know it's dogs. several of you took the time to be here tonight because of this issue. So, so let me commit to you that at least in the next council meeting, which is Tuesday, at the end of our uh, council agendas, we have an opportunity to request future agenda items. It's not agendized for Tuesday, but I can at that time at least comment that, hey, we did get a lot of feedback from the community. Let's go ahead and bring this back to discuss with the full council. I would really appreciate it. Sure. Anything we can do, petitions, uh, pay for bounties, whatever it needs to be done. Like we're willing to help you guys be more proactive because it's kind of passive at the moment. Okay. Thank you for thank you for the feedback, and, and again, thanks to all of you who came tonight for this reason. Uh, next, next question. Next question. This question is from Shannon Hartman. It appears that the Sea Cove Drive near Abalone Cove has had a spike in crime. Your maps are from April 21, but in January through March, we've had some home burglaries. My question is, why are we busting in and inviting more folks to come into our neighborhood? But perhaps also, you know, to expand upon that question, maybe what are some tips for burglary prevention? What what are some actions that residents can take to help? Uh, uh, reduce their likelihood of falling victim to a property crime. So I'll go ahead and comment on this. Um, first off, if, if there's, if, if you see people that are coming in your neighborhood that you know in your mind that don't belong in that neighborhood, please call us. Uh, it's really, really important that you call us and report that. Just report as a suspicious person and we'll send somebody out there. And when I ask you to contact us, I, I meant to say this earlier, but I'll say it now because I've heard some feedback about posting on no, next door and posting on social media. It's really, really important for you to call us first. And I, I, I do monitor next door. I don't post, but I do read it. 
and I read other variations of social media, and I can't count how often I see things post on social media that has never been reported to the sheriff station. So with that being said, is, regarding any busing or busing people in, I'm not too familiar with any, any plans or programs of busing people in, in, into a city. Uh, the only busing f procedures I'm aware of is for schools. Um, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that. I think, I think this, this question is referring to the shuttle program, perhaps, that's, that's ongoing right now. So we have, a, in RPV, a current uh, shuttle pilot program going on. And the intent of this program is uh, to work with the Del Cerro area and encourage people to go to the city hall parking lot. We have a lot more parking there. It's away from the neighborhood. We're trying to reduce the neighborhood impact. And as part of that, we're evaluating uh, this shuttle. And this shuttle essentially goes to uh, three public locations, PVIC, Abalone Cove at the entry point, and then the Gateway Park area currently. So it's um, uh, about midway through, or I think we've got about two months left of the program. So we're going to be uh, looking at the results of this uh, shuttle program pilot and reassessing later in the summer. Yeah. Anything and, to add to that, Art? Yeah, and, and I think what's what's important for the community's understanding is the, the shuttle program isn't intended to invite more people to the um, to use the preserve. We, we are not promoting this uh, on social media and encouraging people from outside the peninsula to, to use the shuttle. What we're doing is when people are in the city and, and the areas that they tend to go to to use our trails, that's where we're, we're advising and notifying people that you can park for free and conveniently at City Hall and, and use the shuttle to go to your destination rather than parking in those residential neighborhoods. The intent here is really to divert um, the parking traffic from being in residential neighborhoods and, and directing them to um, an area that, that is less impactful to the community. So I think we have time for maybe two or three more questions. Sure. This question from Janet Louie, should we call the Lomita Sheriff when we go on vacation? Uh, Absolutely. Um, you go ahead and call the, sh the station's main line. That's 310-539-1661. And you let the operator know that you're going on vacation, your time frame. And we ask that you have an emergency contact in case something does happen while you are on vacation. And we can contact them in case we need to board up something if, if there's a break in. But what would happen is um, once you put in that request, we will come around the house. We will actually walk the property, make sure everything's good. And we will pick up any of the flyers or, or materials in your front yard or your driveway and um, make it look like somebody's there. So for sure, 100% call if you go on vacation. <laughs> that, let your neighbors know you're going to be gone and have them keep an eye on your house as well. Um, it's another component of the uh, crime prevention community policing concept. So um, please do that. And I would add, don't post it on social media because you'd be surprised what people follow on social media. And that was, it's, it, you, people are always posting, I'm, I'm on a plane, I'm going away. You're just telling people that your home's empty. And I th Mackenzie, I think I'm seeing a, a traffic theme from a couple of questions, is that correct? Yes, that's what I'm saying too. So a series of questions relating to traffic and speeding on, this one is on Deep Valley Drive in Rolling Hills Estates. I have some others in uh, Rancho Palos Verdes. Uh, what can be done regarding heavy traffic and speeding throughout the city? Okay, so yeah, so maybe a general commentary response to traffic mitigation effort, speed mitigation efforts, Wayne. Uh, concerning the Deep Valley Drive, actually, we just had a traffic commission meeting a month ago regarding this, and um, we haven't, we've only had two accidents, and I think it was over a five-year period, and they were both side swipes of vehicles, and we, we're not finding any, it seems like you're going fast when somebody's standing there, but we're not finding it to be high-speed area. We uh, did some surveys in there, and it just seems like it's really fast because it's it's a narrow street, and it is um, more populated than it used to be back in back in the day when Deep Valley actually went through um, before the mall was there. But we we are monitoring it, and we have had meetings on it, but we're just not seeing the speeds that that we're hearing the complaints about. So we are we are looking at it. 
Thank you. Any anything to add? Okay. Okay. Another question. This one. Uh, a little more general, uh, they're seeing an increase in vehicle break-ins. What are some tips to try and avoid vehicle break-ins? Um, uh, some of the tips, and these are things we, we go over regularly at neighborhood watch meetings, uh, which that is uh, a great thing to have, a neighborhood watch uh, in place in your neighborhood. Um, like I said, we rely heavily on calls that come in. From, from the residents. And uh, we get a lot of, a lot of good arrest from somebody calling just to say, hey, there's somebody in my neighbor's backyard or somebody in my neighbor's car. So that's, that's one way to prevent it. But some of the biggies are locking the door. That's, that's number, number one. And number two is don't leave things in plain view. If, uh, if you have anything, take it in the house with you. If you absolutely have to leave it in the car, in the trunk, um, I don't really recommend that. I've, I've seen where uh, golfers have left their golf bags in the, in the car and they got followed home. They go in and they can usually pop the trunk from inside the car. So I, I recommend taking everything out. I, I do that myself. Um, park in a, a secured area or a lit area. And uh, if, if you can, garage it. And that, that definitely is, is your best bet. I know a garage doesn't typically hold all the cars in the household, so in the driveway. But definitely make sure the doors are locked and you don't leave uh, valuables in sight. Thank you for that. Maybe one final question, Mackenzie. Okay. Um, one, sorry, trying to get an idea of all of them. Uh, is there... Um, Sorry, these are a lot of traffic questions as well. Uh, are there any other uh, actions that that residents can take when they see areas of high speeding? Um, if if they if they're seeing around their streets that there's a lot of vehicles speeding by, or if they're recognizing loud exhaust, for example, is is there action that they can take? Um, I would just say that they call into the station and report it. I mean, that's the only thing that I can suggest that they do. I would just add to that and reiterate what you said. Yes, definitely call the station. Yeah, and we'll try and get somebody out there in a, in a timely manner to catch them in the act. But uh, knowing, uh, just knowing that those are areas, you can send us emails through the county website and go into our station and let us know of it or just call us and, and make mention of the, uh, you know, if there's certain dates and times or, or uh, behaviors that you see or any vehicle descriptions, we can certainly follow up and monitor traffic in those areas and try and... Uh, enforce the law and sometimes just our visibility and our presence in itself uh, will slow people down a little bit. And one other thing, um, all the cities have traffic commissions or traffic committees. I don't know if they all changed to commissions or committees, but uh, anyway, they, uh, they're they available for residents to go to if you have, if you have something um, bigger than just one car. If it's just one car doing something, yeah, just call us. Um, if it's bigger than that, you can call us, but also attend the meetings. That's very important if you want to be heard. And we work hand in hand with the city. So if, if there is something we can, uh, we work together to put a, a plan together. We'll focus on a certain spot, monitor it, see if, uh, you know, if, if there's actually a big problem and if there is what we can do to, to stop it. And just, just to make you aware, um, all of the cities involved have supplemental traffic enforcement funding that they provide to us so we can put deputies out there above and beyond the, uh, the, the deployment of our regular uh, field status. And so it's above and beyond that as a proactive effort from the cities. And so just, just to make you aware of that, and that's kind of what, what we use those funds for. Thank you. Uh, Mary, Ara, did you have something to add? I, I was just going to add one of the things that um, Rancho Palos Verdes is doing is if we're if you're noticing a trend in speeding in your neighborhood, report it. You can email me. And what we're doing is, is implementing and we're working with a traffic engineer to identify traffic calming um, improvements that we could um, build into the neighborhood to try to slow traffic down. Thank you. Um, so. I appreciate all the, the, the comments and questions. Um, I'd like to give Mayor Derringer and Mayor Pro Tem Zrunian an um, opportunity to make some final comments if they'd like before we wrap up. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll take it home. Uh, I would just say, just because of my 40 years as a deputy DA, a lot of cases have come to be able to be prosecuted uh, because 
residents did what was suggested here. They Someone saw something that looked suspicious uh, and they reported it. And, and then someone else reported something else nearby. And then between all of those witnesses, uh, the police get call, called and they catch somebody in the act. I mean, those are always the best. Um, but, um, the biggest problem I think that we have is that residents um, don't always want to call because they think, well, what if that's just a, a person, you know, that's walking down the street uh, and and maybe they're a new resident. And, and but if it seems suspicious to you, if you don't recognize a person, if they're just um, people who walk around with backpacks in a neighborhood, I mean, backpacks can be totally ordinary, then burglars use that quite a bit. Also, so you need to be aware of that uh, because nowadays, you know, burglars just don't walk out with television sets in their arms or anything like like back in the day when we had people just going and taking the appliances. They go for small things like jewelry, cash, and so um, they carry a backpack and they can just put it in their backpack, look like they're a hiker, things of that nature. But if you see someone that looks of the ordinary or not suspicious, like you just you just have a sixth sense about them. The sheriff's department will come and if they'll check the person out and if they're legitimate, they just say, okay, sorry, we just wanted to check out who you were. And a person who is a resident who is concerned about safety will appreciate the diligence of the sheriff's department in checking them out. Those people who are to no good won't appreciate it, but um, you know, it's always good to just err on the side of just calling and letting uh, the sheriff's department check out and not doing anything on your own uh, to try to gather more information before you report to make sure this is suspicious because then you might endanger yourself. Uh, so that's if someone's in your home uh, or you hear a noise, you, uh, you need to not confront them uh, because people could do something harmful obviously, if confronted. So you need to get to a place where you can call on the phone and have the sheriff's department respond to the scene. Uh, so if you even even when you come home and you see something that looks like your, your house is not in the condition when you left, it, uh, don't go in and, and don't jostle the scene. A lot of times, uh, you know, with uh, being a, a DA, we want to be able to preserve evidence. So if someone comes home and finds that they've been bur burglarized, you don't want to touch anything. You want to call the sheriff's department immediately and, and make sure that they can come down there to take prints, uh, even to see if there's DNA that they can take, be able to uncover areas. And, and you can point out to them where there's items that have been moved within your home so they can test those areas. And, but don't touch them yourself because you already have your prints and DNA in there anyway. You don't need to further uh, contaminate the scene or invite other people to come in and see what happened. So that's kind of part of the, the things we, uh, we uh, like to express too, to make sure we can have the situation in a, in a spot where we can catch the person and then prosecute them so they don't come back uh, to, to further commit crimes in our neighborhoods. Thank you so much, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem Zerunian, did you wanna make final comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you to you, to your staff, as well as uh, Captain and his staff for this opportunity for folks to hear uh, about public safety. The only thing I can say is we are a safe community indeed, but uh, uh, locking our doors, locking our cars uh, is incumbent upon us. Um, I teach law enforcement. Um, in our USC uh, SCI program. And I'll tell you a short anecdote that will tell you exactly what uh, we've been saying tonight. Uh, one of the police officers in Long Beach one time approached me and said, what's up with Pals Verdes? All the gangs know to go there. Um, of course, that was before our cameras and before our diligent efforts to be able to stop those kind of uh, very quick crimes. About a year later, that same police officer was in my class and he says, what's up with Pals Verdes? The word is out that they, we don't wanna go there. 
So it's all about our collective that is really important here. If you allow your door to be open, you're inviting people in. It's all of us that can prevent crime from happening and the responsibility of all of us, not just the sheriff department. I plead with everyone, please, if you see something, say something. Uh, and that's what B was saying, uh, Mayor Ber Derringer was saying. And that's very crucial. The other day, I took a picture of a car that looked unusual to me, just in case that there was an issue with that car, ultimately. It turned out it was nothing. It was a uh, person who was working there, but it looked very unusual and very strange where it was parked. So I took a picture of the license plate just in case. So things like that, please be diligent uh, around you because we can make our secure security ourselves uh, in addition to our sheriff department, which do a very, very good job. Again, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I wish everyone good night. Thank you so much for the comments, Mayor Pro Tem. I know uh, there may have been questions that we did not get to this evening, and if there are remaining, please feel free on our website, uh, certainly to email me directly or, or uh, Mayor Derringer, Mayor Pro Tem, and we'll certainly try to connect you properly to get your questions answered. And I, too, um, want to thank uh, Mayor Derringer, Mayor Pro Tem Zrunian for being with us, and, of course, Captain Powers and the deputies with us as well this evening. So big thanks to them, their partnership. I will acknowledge that although this is uh, a public forum that we're having tonight, we do have peninsula-wide um, public safety committee meetings every quarter. So there are other forums throughout the year that if you have comments, concerns, there are other ways to connect with us uh, as well. So with all that said, a big thank you to Mackenzie and Aura for really all the effort you put into organizing this. So. Thank you so much for doing this. And, and again, thank you to the community for taking the time to come out. Have a good evening. Yes, thank you, everyone.